What's up, Ego Hackers? Welcome to the C.S. Joseph Podcast. Tonight's question is INTJ plus INFP sexuality a good thing? Fascinating question. Like, why not have uh, sexual-based questions? You know what I'm saying? Like, why, why not? Why not Why not just get, like, right, right down to the dirty details? You know, get in the trenches here, right? And if you want... Your dirty details, questions answered. Become an Acolyte member. CSJoseLive forward slash members. Become a journeyman member there, then upgrade to Acolyte from there. Or if you're already a journeyman member, CSJoseLive forward slash portal. Click on the uh, not a member button on the uh, Acolyte piece. Upgrade your account there. And then once a month, you get to ask me a question, and I turn that into a YouTube uh, episode or a podcast episode. Well, both. So that we all can benefit from the answer. So... INTJ and INFP, is this like a is this a good relationship? It is definitely uh, in uh, it's de- okay, so let's look at compatible sex compatible sexual relationships. The, at the very top you have the affection and the companion tied for highest sexual compatibility and uh, with the affection being the highest emotional compatibility. Then you have the natural and the intrigue which is second highest sexual compatibility with the natural being second highest emotional compatibility. So emotional compatibility somewhat drops each level uh, as you go, you know, and then uh, then beyond that you have number five, which is what we would call the silver pair. It's the respect relationship. And then at, uh, and then number um, six is basically what we would used to call the benefactor relationship was a relationship based on trust right that's the trust relationship and INTJs often find themselves in relationships with INFPs because for some reason INTJs find INFPs to be trustworthy and INTJs like especially if they're unconscious developed they really need a little bit more trust than most people because if you remember in season seven, part one, the first uh, 16 episodes of season seven, we're talking about the virtues and vices of each of the types. Not to be confused with the living virtues and the deadly sins that we have in the temples, which is also available at csjoseph.life forward slash members. The uh, deadly sins lectures are incredible and probably my best work. You should definitely check them out. Life changing for everyone. But. Wow, that's like really loud. Who cares? That's why God invented editing. So, anyway. uh, The INTJ usually ends up choosing this relationship. And they're the chooser because they're NI hero. It doesn't matter if they're the man or a woman in this benefactor relationship. Um, But in this relationship, basically, it's... uh, They're the one who ends up choosing the relationship because it's about trust. And they had a hard time trusting people in their life. This is oftentimes why also INTJs end up with INTPs, because introverted sensing child from an INP is very consistent. And having consistency in a relationship is how an INTJ basically is able to trust that person because of that level of consistency. And because they're the NI user of the relationship, they're ultimately the one who chooses the relationship. The expert intuition parent or the NI critic of the INP or the INFP in this particular case doesn't really choose it so much it's just that they've allowed themselves to be chosen by the INTJ and that's ultimately how the relationship starts and the INTJ is just on a quest for consistency maybe they've been burned in the past maybe they had a lot of partners maybe they had a lot of betrayal because INTJs they have they worry about betrayal and they're afraid of rejection but introverted sensing child types they really just don't reject people. They really don't. There's a higher risk of introverted sensing inferior types like ENTPs and ENFPs. There's a higher risk of rejection from those types, but from INTP and INFPs, there's a less like less lower chance of uh, of rejection. So INTJs who want to like play it safe or maybe settle uh, for relationships in their life, they end up having relationships with INPs because to deal with that fear of rejection. 
but they're also worried about betrayal. They're worried about treachery. And just because the INPs are more consistent with their introverted sensing child because they have a really hard time letting go of their comfort zone, it's very easy for them to get stuck in their comfort zone, basically. When they are stuck in their comfort zone, uh, they look more consistent to the INTJ. And because the INTJ has TI critic and not really able to verify whether or not this is a healthy relationship for them or not, it is sexually compatible. It's not emotionally compatible. You know, that can be end up a thing. And, you know, so they, they'll have a great sexual relationship, but their emotional side of the relationship could really, really suck. Why? Because the cognitive origin of the INTJ is reverence. They want a deep respect. Now, if they're able to share that deep respect with the INFP, because the INFP wants respect as well, but the INFP's origin is authority, also known as power. And the INFP may see that they're able to gain more power and more authority uh, from the INTJ, having the INTJ in their life by borrowing the status of the INTJ, basically. So it ends up becoming this exchange of status between these two types in an effort to fulfill their emotional needs, even though they really can't uh, fulfill those emotional needs very well. And this, this can end up creating a lot of conflict uh, over time. And ultimately, in my opinion, a benefactor relationship in the long run is ultimately not sustainable. It's funny because one of my really, really close friends, one of my, one of my best friends, um, he's an INTJ, he was, uh, he had children with an INFP, and she made some really bad decisions, uh, really irresponsible decisions without telling him, because, you know, from her perspective, she had the power to do so, she had the authority in the relationship, but then when he ended up having to clean up her mess, and because she was too slothful and not willing to actually, you know, do something about it, he took away all of her power and authority within the relationship. Well, guess what? That led to divorce. And she ultimately divorced him over that, uh, over that decision, which makes a lot of sense. So honestly, like benefactor relationships, um, I think benefactor relationships, they're kind of like, they're kind of like flings. I'd, I'd say like six, seven, and eight, you know, um, the super ego is next, which is uh, the seventh uh, compatibility. And then the eighth one is the kindred. Those are mostly like fling based relationships. I wouldn't recommend a long-term monogamous investment in those relationships. If you were going to be monogamous, I would choose affection, companion, and natural. Uh, and maybe the respect-based relationship for monogamy uh, or having children with them, etc. But the intrigue, intrigue plus benefactor plus, uh, so intrigue plus uh, trust, refinement, and kindred relationships, I would put those more in the fling category, ultimately, but they're ranked by sexual compatibility, you know, which is how relationships actually start. Most people claim that relationships, you know, can begin from an emotional compatibility point of view, but that's actually categorically false, right? That's, from a psychological standpoint, that's not very, that's not very accurate. And this ends up, you know, creating a lot of uh, conflict in the long run. It's, it's not, it's not as sustainable. That's not to say that if both people in the relationship are really good at communication, they engage with other people, it could be therapy, or they have a, a wide variety of friends that can give them and help meet their emotional needs, and they're always committed to banging it out in the bedroom whenever possible. Those, those four relationships that are lacking emotional compatibility, ultimately, uh, could definitely, you know, fit the, you know, could definitely make it in a monogamous relationship. It just requires a lot more work. It's an uphill battle, basically. It's an uphill battle, right? And that's always, you know, something to just ultimately be aware of. Anyway, uh, so the cognitive origins, you know, end up becoming, well, they continue being a problem. And the thing is, is that if the INFP doesn't feel like they're getting enough power or authority if they do not have enough power and authority in the relationship they're just going to shut down and that's that's a huge issue and then also like the intj if they're like feeling they're not getting that deep respect it's also going to shut down and it's very easy for these two types to perceive and become indignant towards each other within the context of this relationship it's it's a big risk it's like a huge risk 
the reason why is so let, let's talk about indignance and this happens all the time especially with emotionally incompatible sexual relationships indignance is like the worst risk out there so indignance is defined by responding negatively to perceived maltreatment if you are perceiving that you're being treated badly you treat the other person badly even though the other person wasn't actually treating you badly but you perceive that they were so you're lashing out basically this is extremely common amongst intrigue relationships amongst trust relationships like this relationship uh, among uh, kindred relationships and even sometimes companion relationships although companion relationships the child function can actually interface with the critic function pretty well and have some emotional compatibility where it's not entirely draining and because the sexual compatibility is the highest they can they have a lot easier time to like bang it out in the bedroom and then there's like no hard feelings but later in life when sexuality is not as high a priority the problems could end up manifesting over time so they have to really make sure that by then they have their communication tactics and strategies nailed down as a couple to be able to make it through right that's just kind of how it is and it works it, it can work so so yeah folks like that's ultimately like what this relationship is is it a good relationship is it worth investing in yeah definitely definitely from the perspective of a fling definitely do it definitely do it as a fling for sure is this a relationship that i recommend investing for monogamy Nah. or maybe building a family eh, not so much it can happen but it's going to be an uphill battle it will be an uphill battle regardless but as long as you're committed to it you know as long as the INTJ is getting ultimately like that consistency that they're looking for you know it's important but don't forget though that the vice of the INFP is treachery so they look trustworthy but they're not necessarily always going to be trustworthy. And then the INTJ could end up feeling really, really betrayed and then no longer revered by the INFP. And then the INTJ is likely to blow up the relationship, take away their power and authority in the relationship until trust is restored. But the INFP, because they're going to get indignant, is not going to bring that trust back and it's going to fall apart, which is exactly what happened to my friend. And he has two children with an INFP woman where that entire dynamic actually happened so as a result do would i really recommend this relationship for a long term no would i recommend this relationship for a short term absolutely i would so anyway folks thanks for watching and listening i'll see you guys in the next episode